Hello and welcome to A Problem Squared, the problem-solving podcast that is a lot like soup in that we bring a lot of things together and it ends up in a easily digestible form. My name is Matt Parker. I'm a lot like minestrone soup in that minestrone is terrible at writing podcast introductions. So there you are, a lot in common. And my co-host, Beck Hale, is a lot like pea soup and that pea soup is also underwhelmed by this <laughs> you don't know that. podcast introduction. I feel like it's... Pea soup could be a very That's big true. fan. That's true. That's true. Both you and the pea soup. Yeah. I mean, don't worry. I, th- I Hopefully, I've got one joke that's going to just like okay. tie it all together at the end here. Because you see, Beck, podcasts like soup can be consumed <laughs> via cans. And that's, that's the whole... That's the, that's, that's the, we call that the foundational joke of the whole, the whole introduction. Cans being the industry term for headphones. Yes. Yes. And, cool. and you can, and you can consume podcasts via, yeah. via headphones. Or, you know, or via those tin can phones, you could consume it via that. You could listen you to a, a podcast. you had a long enough string, unobstructed. Oh, you know, I've always wanted to see, like, if I could send computer data of a tin can, like, Ooh. telephone thing. By literally having a speaker reading out ones and zeros on one end and like a mic that's then converting it back into binary at the other. Oh, but I really want to do that now. Maybe if we ever do day. a live tour. Isn't it amazing? Oh, yeah. Anyway, on this episode. I see F-I-K-N-L-P-U. Looking forward to that. Um, I worked out if Michael Jackson's hair catching fire during a Pepsi commercial was the exact midpoint of his life. And N E F R B Z N S. <laughs> oh my, it's gonna. Uh, why weren't you doing the intro? <laughs> First up, some big news. We've now got our 1 million downloads, commemorative plates, and our 1 million download. Commemorative bowls available to order. I'm so just, it's uh, so ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> but we don't know what the relative popularity is going to be between the plates and the bowls. Mm. And we don't know how many people are going to want them. So we're, we're doing a limited run and it's limited to how many people want to buy one. Yes. As in, as in, this is the only time they'll be available. You either order them now or you never get one. Yeah. So we've got a link. It's in the show notes. You can, you can basically... You give us your card details and you pay for them now and then we'll order a bunch and you'll magically get them in the future. you got to trust us. Yes. You know, uh, you know where we live. Our wizard supporters will be getting one for free on oh, yes. Patreon. Wizards, we're going to sort you out. Don't worry. Yeah. At some point, you will receive. Anyway, at some point. A plate yes, slash we're, not, we're not promising a timeline. Yeah. We may hit 2 million downloads. No, we won't. <laughs> we'll do it before 2 million. <laughs> we got to what, November? We're fine. We're fine. Anyway, Beck, how have you been? I'm good. I'm good. Guess what? Good. What? We have a new addition to our to our family of of two at the moment. No, a replacement pet. I mean, you can never replace a pet, can you? That's true. That's very true. But we do yeah, have a, a new pet. Oh my goodness! Now, originally, we said that if we had another hamster, we would call it sausage. Um, uh, yes, I was looking I forward this. to us having a problem sausage. <laughs> yeah, you t- you started with the title, work back to the hamster. Yeah, but um, we, and by we, I mean uh, my husband Gav and I, got this little hamster, and after spending some time with him, we were like, mm, I don't think he's his sausage. He just didn't Not seem a like a sausage. But we realized he's a peanut. His name is Peanut. Oh, Peanut. Peanut. So we can have a Peanut Squared. We can have a Peanut Squared. That still yeah. works. That still works. So I thought I might start by doing a very, very quick A Peanut Squared problem for any young listeners. Oh my goodness. We'll start sort of um, relatively simple, I thought, because it's been a while. So uh, for anyone with uh, children or access to children who want to give this one a go and send in the answer to aproblemsquared.com, the A Peanut Squared, the first one is if Peanut needs to eat five grams of pellets every day and And is that a realistic amount of hamster food yes that is the okay yeah i think that's right i'm so used to to mass problems being you know peanut has to buy 17 watermelons or something oh yeah no with no no relation (laughs) to reality 
Uh, but I don't know how much a hamster would eat, but five grams feels about right. That, that so seems... if peanut needs to have five grams of pellets a day, and on average, hamsters can live two years, or roughly about two years, how many pellets are we going to need over a peanut's lifetime? Wow. In grams. That's uh, uh, grams of yeah. pellets, yes. And if you were to convert those into watermelons, <laughs> how many watermelons? Are you asking that? So... Are you just going to bulk purchase one lifetime supply of hamster food? I think we only really got through one bag with pudding. So I think we might already yes. have that. Yeah, but... Exactly. <laughs> so there you go. That's the, that's, that's the peanut squared. That's great. Great peanut squared. And I suspect you're going to have pictures of peanut all over social media. So people want to see, see the hamster in question. They can check out your socials. Well, he's not quite tame yet, but I did get a video of him sleeping the other day and doing the little with his mouth as he was sleeping. It was very cute. How about you, Matt? How have you been? I'm good. I'm good. Um, new, well, okay. So I woke up this morning, uncertain what I would discuss in the catch up here, but I figured I'll just chat about, you know, what whatever had come to mind at the time. But between me awaking and now, a new tiling pattern has dropped. So there's <laughs> now a whole new... A whole new tile out there, which I'm very excited Wait. about. Okay, I find this confusing because surely a tiling pattern can just be whatever anyone wants it to be. Correct. And that's what I've explained to people doing tiling for me many times now <laughs> when they insist on using rectangles. But, <laughs> and you've seen some of the tiling patterns in my house. So, you know, I've uh, pushed the boundaries of what builders Tilers will do Tilers and you. bricks, yes. Exactly, yes. Um, so anyway, so no, this is within a certain constraint. So you're right. You could have whatever kind of crazy tiling patterns you want. This is a type of tiling pattern, which is called an aperiodic tile. And an aperiodic tile means it'll never repeat. The pattern will never repeat. Uh -huh. So aperiodic, no period. So you can never like slide it over and it will match. So you, you keep tiling forever and ever and ever, and it'll never repeat. And that's, that's, it's not, there's another thing which is called non-periodic tiling and that just means the tiles could have been periodic and repeated nicely but you've just put them down a weird way so they don't yeah. aperiodic tiles it's impossible to tile with this shape or shapes such that you get a nice repeating pattern that sounds and, awful um the, i know it's so good it's great <laughs> and the original examples of this used lots of different shapes so instead of just tiling all with the same shape you had to combine originally thousands mm -hmm. and then eventually someone called roger penrose was the first person that found others since got it down to a tiling pattern where you only need two different shapes right because i was going to say it at first it didn't sound that impressive because like a mosaic you know that's when you're using broken bits of yeah. tile and stuff to make yeah. a picture yeah. or something but you could argue that doesn't there's repeat. No repeat yeah, yeah. whereas a product tiling it, it's a weird balance because it's got to be systematic enough that you've only got a few shapes and they kind of always go together the same way. It's not like you're just freestyling. Mm. They fit together in a particular way, but that particular way will never repeat. So so the big breakthrough today, someone found an aperiodic tiling that only involves one shape, a single tile that repeats over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And other people have gotten close in the past, but the tiles uh, had to overlap which is mm. kind of not good for tiling, or they were non-contiguous. So each tile would be made of two separate bits that weren't joined together, but had to always be arranged relative to each other the same way every single time. It's like there's like a handle coming out to join the two bits together. Yeah. And up until now, people had only found ways to do it with two different shapes, so two different colors yeah. in that case. Mm -hmm. And people have cracked it with just one shape, one color, and that will uh, give you a pattern that never repeats. That's very impressive. The other thing that's interesting is they didn't just find one of these. They actually found an infinite family. So there's infinitely many patterns that have this same property, and they've released a video where it fades between them all. So I'll uh, we can share that as well. It's got a slowly evolving pattern. If you look very closely, the shapes are gradually changing. Oh, yeah, yeah. And every single one of these steps, apart from the exact beginning, middle, and end, are an aperiodic tiling involving only one tile. So actually, they could have picked any of these to represent the tiling because they all work. They just picked the one that looked the neatest. 
Huh. Um, but all of those work, all the in-between ones. It's, I think it's interesting there are still tiling patterns to be discovered out there. So um, It is exciting. Yeah. Our first problem today came in anonymously, which we respect, on the problem posing page at aproblemsquared.com. Anonymous says, tedious and odious are fun words because they neatly shorten to letter name versions. Oh, okay. And, th and then here they got TDS is in the letters T, D, and S. And ODS, O, D, S. Oh, that's, that's quite cute. They then say, what would you call this abbreviation method? And what are other fun words that do this? All right, Beck. Yeah, I have. I got really excited about this because the more I thought about it, the more I realized that this is something that is probably more common than I thought about, really. Like quite often you will still see words being replaced by letters phonetically. One example is like an IOU. IOU, that's a good point, yeah. Those of us who are real old from the internet know ICQ. Yeah, yeah. Uh oh <laughs> uh -oh. That's what I remember. Uh-oh. <laughs> but I realized, yeah, I don't actually know the term for it. So I looked it up. It is a grammogram. Or a grammogram. A literal word, which I love. A literal word. A literal That's word like... or a grammogram. Wow. Yeah. That was easy. Yeah. Easy, that's one. Easy, but I, yeah. Nice. EZ. That was really EZ. <laughs> but it. interestingly, like depending on how you pronounce things, it makes a difference, not just in English, but in other languages. So in researching this, I actually found out that the artist, Marcel Duchamp, I think I'm pronouncing that right, I hope. The uh, one with the urinal. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the urinal, which the piece was called Fountain. Oh, didn't 1917. know 1917. Wow. Yeah. We got surreal real early. That's it. Well, in 1919, Marcel Duchamp did a piece, well, did a series of pieces called uh, Ready Maids. And that, that was sort of like, sort of like found out, like they were grabbing yep. bits of things and putting them together to create art. And so it was like a print of Mona Lisa with a moustache. And the piece was called L-H-O-O-Q. L-H-O-O-Q. Yeah. And if you read those letters aloud in French, then it sounds very similar to Elle la chaude de cool. I feel like which, you nailed it. If it's correct, <laughs> translates <laughs> oh. as... She is hot in the ass. <laughs> right. <laughs> so art. Art. There you go. There's some some really good <laughs> art there. I tried to find the earliest example of a grammogram or, or literal words being used. Yeah. Uh, it was actually really difficult. The earliest one I could find myself was a poem, which was oh. it was a poem in 1886. Oh, that's quite recent. It was printed in the Indiana School Journal. And the poem it goes on for quite, quite a bit, but I'll read out the first part and see if you can hear where the, the letters are being used in place of, of words. Yep, got one there. The farmer has no easy life. The seed he sows will rot. And when it Evie rests from strife, his bones will ache a lot. His bones will what? Ache. Ache, oh, a, lot. ache a lot. Right. It's quite a nice one because in Evie rests, the E at the end of V is being used as he yeah, in the next yeah. bit. So you're actually combining two words in that bit. It's lovely. That's very clever. The most famous example I could think of, though, was, and this was the first thing I thought of when I got the problem, was the two Ronnie sketch. Right. Which, the, which is a Swedish made These simple. are British comedians. The premise is that they're teaching, yeah, that's right, British comedians. The, the premise is that they're teaching people to speak Swedish. They're definitely right. not <laughs> using using letters. Oh, this is going to be real. So I'll play a real little clip from that. Let's do it. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> are you BC? <laughs> yes, we are BC. <laughs> F-U-N-E-X. <laughs> yes, B-F-X. <laughs> U N E M nine. That was the uh, the least xenophobic of all 1970s British comedy. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs>
So I did, as you've seen, there is a little bit in other languages and that got me down a bit of a wormhole when it comes to using numbers in stuff as well. I couldn't actually find a specific term for when numbers are used instead of words. Oh, so right. So it just kept coming under grammogram. Got so it. I guess Might be the same it's thing. in there. There is also a term for, I think it's numeronym. Numeronym. So I'm definitely mispronouncing that. But essentially that's words that use letters in it, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're read aloud phonetically. So, I mean, canine is a phonetic one. Oh, yeah. The letter K, K and the number nine. literal word, if yeah, we're including digits. but they also included things like uh, W3, which means World Wide Web because it's meant to be W yep, but three yep. times. <laughs> there wasn't a specific word covering that. But in other languages, it's interesting how many times numbers or numerals are used instead of words. So in, in Thai and uh, a few other East Asian languages, uh, the number five is used a lot because five is pronounced ha. Huh. Five, five, five. Uh-huh. That's ha, ha, ha. Uh-huh. So it's basically the same as writing lol. That's great. But in terms of other words that we can make with just the letters, uh, the longest one I could find is uh, expediency, expediency, which is 10 letters long. And you can spell it with five letters, X-P-D-N-C. That's great. I mean, that is expedient. It's very expedient. There's a paper by William E. Brandt Jr., which was published in 2003 called a dictionary of letter words. They've tried to come up with as many as they could. Some of them are using numbers, which I've actually discounted. Like a lot of the time in my life, I'm going to allow that. William E. Brandt Jr. actually produced a paper in 2003, which included a dictionary of letter words. So uh, there's some in here which are quite fun. RT. RT. Meaning RT. RT. SA. SA. An SA. NRG. So they've also listed... Inexpediency, oh, which is please expediency, with an but with front, an N at yeah. the beginning. Is there a name for like half literal words, like express or something, where half the words replaced with a letter? I couldn't Semi-literal find any. Word. No, yeah, I couldn't find, but but maybe that's what we'll call it—a semi-literal word. <laughs> <laughs> there were also some picture books. Uh, there was one that was published in. The 60s, I think it was, by William Stieg, wrote a, uh, a book called CDB. And it was a picture book for kids B. where it was CDB and they're pointing at a B. And they actually had a follow-up book, I, I think it was either in the 70s or 80s, called CDC. <laughs> it's very cute. Normally, children's reading books are to help children better understand how to read letters. Very, very rarely do you get a book like that that's deliberately counterproductive in terms of teaching children how to yeah, process exactly. language. Good on them. That's art. I, what I thought was quite interesting is looking for examples of it, I started to realize that we probably see less of it nowadays than we did maybe a couple of decades ago. And I think that literal words were at their peak. And look, this is just me throwing a theory yeah. out there. But I think literal words were at their peak when texting was more expensive and you were limited by characters right? because then you, you did whatever you could to shorten yeah, a word. Whereas now we don't necessarily pay by Back when you paid by or, character. Oof. Yeah. And with predictive texting and stuff as well, we're seeing a lot less of that sort of shortened or anything like leet speak or anything like that. You're not getting it as much because your phone or computer or whatever is correcting it for you as you write. There you go. That's Anonymous's question. That's great. Answered. I hope I gave enough examples Beck, there. I'm going to say that is great with an eight. And I'm going to give you a, a dung. <laughs> Just a D. Well Just give me a D. DM. Oh, no, wait. I take that back. You've, you've DN a great job <laughs> with an eight. Thank you. <laughs> this next problem comes from the internet via Bobby Fingers. Yes, <laughs> that works. Yeah. By you, I think, strictly speaking. By me. Yeah, that's right. So this all started because my friend has a YouTube channel where he makes dioramas. He makes overly accurate, unnecessarily accurate, let's say, and detailed dioramas of recent moments in pop, unusual recent moments in pop culture history. We'll yeah. Do. Controversial, I would say. Controversial. Yes, we'll do that. And I will say, I love the channel, but we'll give it, give it a mild content warning. Because I know yes. uh, people listen to this podcast with their kids. Yeah. And kids listen to it by themselves. Uh, it's it's uh, adults channel. Yes. 
Don't watch. I mean, amazing. If you if you do a peanut squared, don't watch Bobby Fingers yet. Yes, you can do one or the yeah. other. No one, no one should be doing both a peanut squared and Bobby Fingers. You got to pick a lane. Yeah, that's right. And and the lane is about age eighteen. Yeah, there's you. That's right. <laughs> and he decided to make a diorama of Michael Jackson's hair catching on fire during the making of a Pepsi <laughs> commercial. Yes. But one thing that Bobby mentioned was the fact that that moment where Michael Jackson's hair caught on fire, it was sort of internet law that it had happened at the exact midpoint of Michael Jackson's life. And he came to me and said, you know, someone who knows math people, can you recommend anyone who I can go to about this? So I forwarded him to you and then you you did some maths. Well, the, the first instance, if people have seen the video, is Bobby wanted a hilariously overqualified mathematicians to, to be dismissive. Yes. And so I hooked him up with my friend, Professor Sir David Spiegelholter, who fully embraced the joke. Yeah, it's very and funny. It's, I think that's very funny. It's very funny. And then what I love is I texted you about this saying, he's yep. looking for this and you sent me some names uh, that might be up for it. But then as you were doing that, you also then sent, started to send me your calculations for working out like you started to get <laughs> yes, into it yes. and I know what, at no yeah. point had I or Bobby or anyone asked you to do that. Yeah. So basically I, first of all, I was like, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, fulfill the remit of this request and, and find mathematicians I think would be up for this. But then I started, I was like, wait a minute, was it the exact, like how close is it? I thought. And, and I thought, well, first of all, it'll be, it'll be an easy, easy check because you can work out the number of days between things pretty quickly. You can, there's a bunch of websites that do this. You can do it in Excel. If you put two dates into Excel and then do one, subtract the other one, it'll give you the number of days between them. Wow. Well, actually, it'll give you the number of days between them plus one because it gives you the number of days that pass. And this is where you're going to be a little bit careful. In Excel, it'll be the number of days that pass to get from one date to another date. Mm -hmm. Whereas I want to know the exact number of days in between. And I made, it, I made a video about this. It's on YouTube. And, and some people in the comments were trying to say I got it wrong because they did it in Excel and they forgot about compensating for that extra day hmm. that you get. So you, you can be a little careful. And so what I did was I looked up that Michael Jackson was born on the 29th of August, 1958. He died on the 25th of June, 2009. And so I put those into Excel, subtracted one from the other, made sure I compensated for the extra day on the end. And it meant if you exclude the day Michael Jackson was born and the day he died, there were 18,562 days in between which is an even number, which means there's no like central day, like yeah. there's an even number of days. But the midnight, the crossover between those, because I just divided that by two and yeah. added it onto his birth date. And sure enough, the, the, the exact halfway point is the midnight between the 26th and the 27th of January, 1984, and Michael Jackson's hair caught on fire on that 27th of January, Amazing. 1984. And that didn't take me long to do that. It was just like open Excel, do a quick bit of crunching. And I was like, because I, I thought I could reply and say, no, it's not true quite quickly, as well as sending you recommendations to pass on to Bobby yeah. for people. And then I was like, oh, nuts, that's close. That could go either way. Well, it's going to go either way, depending on what time Michael Jackson was born and died. Yeah. Because the, the little bits, how long he lived on the day he was born. And how long he lived on the day he died is going to drag the, the halfway point in his life one way or the other. Mm. Then I was in too deep. So no one asked me to do this, but I was like, oh my goodness, I'm going to look it up. So I looked it up and Michael Jackson died at 2.26 in the afternoon. I'm like, okay, great. Got that. Piece of cake. Can't go wrong. When was he born? Well, we don't know. There's some astrology sites that claim to have his time of birth, but I gave that about as much credit as I give any facts on an astrology website. So let's just say their bar yeah. for verifying facts is low. So I decided, you know what? I'll just assume it could be at any point in time that was deemed to be 29th of August, 1958 in Gary, Indiana. Yeah. Uh, so, so I was like, oh, fine. Okay. So I'll just have air about. I'll have, I'll have uh, upper and lower bounds. He was born somewhere between midnight to midnight, 29th of August. But then I was like, oh, wait, time zones, because there's different time zones. So annoyingly, <laughs> Gary, Indiana, in 1958, when Michael Jackson was born, was in a weird transitional period. So I looked up the regulations, like the, the historical legislation around daylight saving time in 
Gary, Indiana, or in Indiana in general, in the 1950s. And there was a big vote in 1956 about whether or not they should have daylight saving. If they don't, which time zone they stay on. And the General Assembly made Central Time the official time of the state, but permitted any community to switch to daylight saving time during the summer. The law forbid them from doing that during the winter, had to be Central Time in the winter, but they could opt in to be daylight saving time during the summer. And Michael Jackson was born in the summer. And I cannot, for the life of me, find anywhere that confirms if Gary and Deanna did or did not switch to daylight savings during the summer of Michael Jackson's birth. So I must apologize to everyone that that's still up in the air. We don't know. But what we can do is we can kind of factor that in. So we can say Michael Jackson was born between, like the latest is not on daylight saving and the earliest is on daylight saving. Actually gives us a 25-hour window over which he could have been born. You've also got to compensate for time zones for when he died because he died in LA during daylight saving. So actually, it wasn't 2.26 in the afternoon. It was 1.26 in the afternoon, normal Pacific time. And <laughs> then you got to work out what time and what time zone his hair caught on fire. Yeah. And I looked up contemporary publications at the time. And, uh, oh, by the way, at this point, this point, I've moved on from when, when I had messaged you and said, I, I, think, I think it might have been on the day. Because at the time, I just kind of looked up. I was like, oh, when did he die? When could he have been born, et cetera. Yeah. But then I was like, you know what? I'm in too deep now. I've got to do this properly. <laughs> I need to actually do some proper research. You had to do a Dexter. And convince myself once and for all. I had to do a Dexter. I got fully Dexter on this. Dexter, don't, not old enough to watch, watch Bobby, Bobby Figures. Don't watch Bobby Figures. <laughs> don't watch Bobby Figures. And so I then was like, I'm going to have to look up some historical papers. So first of all, I actually, I found what I think is the original stating of this fact from April 2019. So quite a recent fact, someone on the Michael Jackson community forums in the Michael Jackson news and discussion. <laughs> I mean, I guess they're running out of Michael Jackson news. <laughs> so this counts. <laughs> they said, okay, so I was fiddling around. I mean, terrible choice of words. Um, <laughs> To see when the middle of Michael Jackson's life was. Hey, I'm just reading it as written. Yeah. By doing this, I calculated the days and hours of when he was born and died. Therefore, Michael Jackson was alive for 18,563 days. Okay, they've made the fence post mistake by including the, like, yeah. the end day, but not the start day. Classic. I divided this by two to make 9,281 and a half days. I factored in the hours. Oh, then they subtracted that from his date of death and they got Friday the 27th 1984 which was when his hair caught on fire so then they say the exact midpoint of Michael Jackson's life was when his hair set on fire so they've made a mistake in that and they've then not been very accurate when they're looking at the number of days yeah so but th to their credit that was pretty good pretty good solid start so then I looked up when his hair actually caught on fire found a newspaper story from the following day, and it just says that his hair caught on fire when he was dancing down a stairway at the Shrine Auditorium Friday night for a scene in a multi-million dollar Pepsi commercial. And, and that's the, cl the closest I can get to an official time was it was filmed at night. Well, you made a video about this, and I was Correct. looking through the comments, mainly because... Oh, wow. Bold. You didn't reference me in your video whatsoever. And I wanted to see if anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby Figures uh, now... thanked me in his description. <laughs> That's, oh my goodness. I'll put it in the description. <laughs> hey, I said friend of a friend. Yeah, factually correct. Well, was. How many apparently friends, how apparently many not a good I enough have? friend to mention. <laughs> Oh my god, fine, I'll put it in. <laughs> no, it's good, it's good. I was able to show up quite enigmatically uh, in some of the comments where people were trying to guess who the friend of the friend is. But I did like, someone was saying, you sent, I think you sent this to me as well, but I'd seen it, someone was like, there's someone out there who's friends with well, both they, Matt Parker They were like, Bobby imagine Fingers. being the guy who's friends with both of them, and I was like, I prefer the pronoun what kind dude. kind of a legend? <laughs> you know what I'm doing right now, Beck? I've logged into my YouTube account. <laughs> content. This is some real BTS edits. stuff. Okay. And a huge thanks <laughs> to my good friend, Caps Lock 
Beck Hill. How's that? Anything you'd like to add, Harold? <laughs> no, no, that's uh, that's more than enough. Thank you. She did not ask me to, and I'm not going to add that. It's just going to leave it like no, that. No, please put that. Uh, P.S. Hello to everyone reading this from a problem squared. <laughs> we, we need go. to hide some <laughs> coordinates in there. Do some sort of treasure hunt. Ah, oh, yeah, we do. Okay. Well, it, it's, uh, yeah. Well, um, I've still got my pin up, but anyway, we'll get to that in a second. Save. There you go. Okay. Thank you. All done. Thanks. All fixed. Everyone's So while now. I was going through the comments on a narcissistic level, I did find that <laughs> <laughs> I did find that someone had mentioned that they found a news article that stated that his hair caught on fire at 6 30 p.m. or around 6 30 oh, really? p.m. Yeah. Oh, I missed that. 6 30. You know, I'll make a note now to go and delete that comment. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so 6.30, that, that still works with my theory because uh, I, I feel like that's night. Because I worked out if you take the time of his death and you take the latest point at which he could have been born, that point ends up being 5.43 in the morning, the midpoint of his life. So the latest, the midpoint in Michael Jackson's life could have been was 5.43 in the morning of the 27th of January. So, so night or 6.30 p.m. could not have been the midpoint of his life. So do you, do, do you think that still counts? Because you could say that the exact midpoint of Michael Jackson's life occurred maybe on the same day as the day when his hair caught on fire. Yeah. I mean, that's something. I think it counts. That's kind of interesting. I think when you, like, okay, if someone said to you, Matt, on the mid at the midpoint of your life, yep. your hand will fall off. <laughs> <laughs> right, yep. And you knew what date that was. If it falls off at any point during that day, you're going to be like, oh, it was true. I don't know. I feel like a hand falling off is a slower process. Than hair catching than on your fire. Hair catching on fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I feel well, like I'd be it's... like, oh, it start, like it's, it's a process of falling off. Sure. You know what I reckon? I think there's a non-zero chance that the exact midpoint of my life was when I had to edit that video description to thank you. Oh, yeah. I think future historian, future on the Matt Parker forum news section, a, a decade after my death, people be like, I just worked out the exact midpoint of Matt's life was the moment when he edited the video description to include back. I, so people are like, well, yes. I mean, we all split Matt's career into before and after. Yeah. Until that happened. I hope you're <laughs> not right because I like to feel that you'll live l longer than that. <laughs> Well, Statistically, that, that probably me not. Just shy but... of eighty-four. Yeah. Uh, mm, eh, you can eh, pull an Adam, eh, bro. Eh, I, yeah, I could. Other than now, now is viable midpoint of my life territory. Are there any it occurs other? To me making the video, I'm like, I'm like, what if this video was the midpoint of my life? Talking about the midpoint of someone else's life. Well, you know what though? The problem with that is that a very dedicated person with murderous intent uh -oh. could make sure it was the exact yeah. midpoint of your life. They, they could. They could. And um, I got dangerously close to that because, so Bobby famously buries the dioramas once they're done mm. and hides the coordinates for where they are in, in, in the video somewhere. And actually, do we know? Has anyone dug up Michael yet? Oh, good question. Or is question. that embargoed information? I did see a few people in the comments had said that they were on their way to check the coordinates. On their way to get it. Because for people who do watch Bobby's, people who are of the appropriate age that watch Bobby Fingers It's been videos, found. It's been found. Yep. There you go. Bobby releases the videos a day early on Patreon, and sometimes that extra day's head start is all people need to find it. It's amazing. I also have to say that, Bob, I've just realized that Bobby, as of us recording this, is only a few hundred people, subscribers shy of beating me in subscribers. Oh, no. And he's only made three videos. <laughs> we can edit out all our references to, to his channel. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> Or, yeah. or, you know, <laughs> if anyone goes to watch Bobby Fingers from this podcast, check out Beck Hill Comedian. That's a youtube.com slash at Beck Hill Comedian. Yeah. I mean, my career is going to be split to before and after I had more subscribers uh, than Bobby Fingers. It's a matter of time. It's a, a, a criminally under underappreciated channel, but still new. So, you know, give it time. So anyway, I, I realized I couldn't, I considered burying the pin-up board I used in the video. I had like a conspiracy theory board with string and pins and stuff stuck to it. And I was like, oh, I could bury the whole board somewhere. I would have and loved it so like, much Man. if your video ended with cutting to you out in a field and a shovel. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it, it crossed my mind. 
uh, I was a bit low on time and effort. So instead, I put all the contents of the pin board, except for the pins and the board, into an envelope. And I've been carrying it around with me ever since. Mm. And the first person who asks for it can have it. And I imagine by the time this podcast goes out, that will have happened. As of the time of recording, I've only been outside to walk my dog. And I've dutifully carried it with me every time I walk the dog on the right. tiny, tiny chance someone in rural Surrey would be like, Oi, go that guy. Give me the Michael Jackson stuff. Well, I'm seeing you. At, you're getting your medal that you mentioned in a previous episode tomorrow. I am. At the time tomorrow. of recording. I'm seeing you tomorrow. So if someone doesn't ask you before I see you, I'm going to ask. And then if anyone oh, wants it, yeah. they have to find They're me. They're going to find you. Yeah. <laughs> That's so good. Come on. <laughs> we'll be talking to each other and some, a listener someone from the will podcast come up. will come up. Because we, you were all invited. And I'm looking forward to seeing some of you there. Someone will come up and say like, oh, Beck, did you get that stuff yet? And then the look on your face, they'll be like, Matt, can I have it? And I'll be like, they were, they were first, I'm afraid. Too late. So the original problem sent to me by Bobby was just, can you recommend a friend to help out with the video? And in exchange, I ended up making a 15 minute video about the maths of if Michael Jackson's hair catching fire during a Pepsi commercial was the exact midpoint of his life. And I thoroughly enjoyed watching your video and hearing you talk about it in this episode. So I'm going to give you a double ding for that. Thank you. I like to double ding all my material, you know, get maximum value out of that. I'm going to give you a Bobby Dingers. Hey, hey good work. <laughs> Finally, it is time for A N E O B Z N S. I think that's no. how it works. What? What is it? <laughs> N E. N E. Oh, I did A N E. Why did I do A? You're right. N E. N E A. Hang on. N E O B Z N S. Yeah. Pretty good. Sort of, yeah. B Z N S. I've got N E F F R. N E F R B Z N S. <laughs> What's the F? FR sounds like other. Oh, I see what you're doing. Okay. N-E-F-R-B-Z-N-S. Okay, so the first bit of N-E-F-R-B-Z-N-S is a stump date. <laughs> Got a stump date. Yay! We've had the stump handover. It has happened. The, uh, the stump has been passed on to James, who's passed it on to their parents, who, are, well, their parents are currently on vacation. As soon as they get back, it's going to get straight into the stump. Very exciting. So the stump is progressing, but James did ask if there was any, any direction I wanted the stump to go in. And I said, nope, I'm going to hand it over to whatever artistic interpretation is decided by the woodworkers. So we will find out what the stump is turned into. I'm very mm. excited. Our next bit of BZNS is in relation to episode 054, where Matt and I were arguing about what the best sort of unmarked ruler would be. Matt, I feel you, like that needs no no elaboration whatsoever. You gave an option of two differently sized rulers. Thank you. With two to three not. markings on them. Yeah, I was very proud. And sub N-E-F-R-B-Z-N-S, I am now working on if I can get them like manufactured as rulers. So just, you know. I, you know wow. Um, well, I'm dub doubling down on the double rule. Maybe before you do that, there. you should see what the results of our survey was. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Because I'm sure my ruler won in a landslide. I argue an, a, that an my idea immeasurable amount. I argue that my idea would be better, which was to make a one centimeter ruler that is folded uh, accordion style. A series style. of one centimeter rulers hinged like a Constantina. Yeah. So we took photos of our little cardboard prototypes. Your prototypes. Put them yeah. on Twitter. We had a result. 48.7% said they want yours. 51.3% uh, said that they go for the accordion ruler. What? 49 to 51. I am. That's a. Um, I know. I'm outraged as well because it should have been far more for the accordion. I can't believe anyone voted for yours. <laughs> hey, this, this is you know, Brexit levels of, of close. I know. I don't think and famously we can make, in Brexit. Make any sweeping decisions based on that smaller margin. <laughs> wow, 310 people voted. So that's 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 a that's a lot. Like that's I think that's a, I think the audience are split. I think that's a significant split. We've had we've had larger vote counts before, but neither of us retweeted it this time. 
No, that's true. Because <laughs> we were both very confident that we were going to win it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but if I retweet something, I don't trust people who follow me to find it hilarious to do the opposite of what I would like. Mm -hmm. So, kept real quiet about that one. Final bit of N-E-F-R-B-Z-N-S. Uh, several people contacted me to say they could give me a hand with the data that I collected on my phone when I went around Silverstone on a MotoGP bike. And uh, thank you to everyone. I'm going to e email it out to everyone. So uh, have uh, people who asked nicely, I'll give it to you. Have a go at crunching it. Anyone who successfully crunches it and gets me back some nice plots, I will mention them in the video. You know me, I will mention people at the drop of a hat, you know, and any any reason whatsoever, by name, I will, I will name check them in a video. So anyone who can have a go with that data and get back to me will be uh, thanked at length. Yeah. And any, anyone associated with me finding them will be mentioned. So that'd be great. Wow. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much to everyone who listens to this podcast. That's why we do it. I mean, other than it's an excuse for us to catch up, but um, mm -hmm. primarily we, we're glad that you enjoy it and thank you for sending in your problems. But you know what? We also got bills to pay and this whole thing is funded not by ads, not by sponsored content, but solely by our fantastic Patreon supporters. Huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon. And uh, not only do they get an extra bonus ridiculous episode once a month and everyone else, you're not missing out on much, but mm -hmm. we pick three of their names at random to thank every single episode and i've just generated our three random names which this time includes christopher harper justin begley joe lee thank you so much to everyone else i think they're all new names actually Jolie, on patreon who support us if you go Jolie, Jolie. Oh, you sing a Jolie song. i wonder if they've heard that a lot of times i'm already. thanking you for if not, paying our patreon <laughs> Okay, I cannot guarantee everyone gets a novel song written about their name by Beck, but there's now a non-zero chance if you support us at patreon.com slash a problem squared. I'm sure we'll link to that in the show notes as well. This bubbling hot bowl of deliciousness <laughs> known as a problem squared has been me, Matt Parker, Beck Hill, and our producer, the uh, the the stirrer of this all together, Lauren Armstrong Carter. <laughs> like Thanks for listening. <laughs> like a witch. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm imagining. The big cauldron of our podcast. <laughs> Okay, Beck. Yep. Now, this is going to sound weird. I need you to pick a Jim Henson character. Oh, this is ridiculous. So we've been doing a Which Muppet Are You BuzzFeed quiz. And question, what are we up to now? Four? Question four is just pick a Jim Henson character. That's ridiculous. You can't just, it can't be like, it's, it's like a seven that's like, what sandwich are you? And question one is like, pick a sandwich that represents you. Yeah. This is ridiculous. <laughs> what do you like? Pickles and cheese? Ham? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, name your favorite. Uh, so anyway, they list a bunch of um, Muppet. I mean, they're all Muppets. They're all Jim Henson characters, I guess. I mean, one of them's David Bowie, so. That's not even a character. Huh. That's a man. <laughs> it's just, oh, no, it says Jareth. I guess. That's, oh, okay. No, right. The, the character, yeah. Huh. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick Bert. Well, you have to read them out, Matt. Oh, sorry. You can't choose them if There's... I don't know what they are, except for. Ah, uh, here they David are. Okay, Bowie. are you ready? There's nine of them. They are in the order presented by BuzzFeed: a doozer, which are the ones from the um, Is that the uh, phenomenon? Fraggle Rock, the the small ones in Fraggle Rock. Oh, okay, okay. Doozers. One that just says nanny and has the lower half of a person. I don't know what that's in reference to. Someone with a better knowledge of Jim Henson law might know. Uh, a character called Red. I think that's a Fraggle Rock character as well. Jareth. Uh, Bowie. Ludo. Don't know what Ludo's, Ludo's from. from. Big old Ludo's monster. from Labyrinth. Ludo Labyrinth smell from... bad. Oh. oh, there you go. Well, I uh, see so you've made your choice. You then got Bert, uh, as in uh, first name Bert, last name, and Ernie. You've got Jen, another character I don't recognize. Snuffy, because they couldn't be bothered writing Snuffleupagus. <laughs> Unbelievable. And Sir Didmus. Where's Didymus. Didymus. So Didymus, Didymus is also from? from Labyrinth. He is. Oh, this is a real lazy quiz now. But so Didymus, yeah, so Didymus is like a little fox guy and he rides a dog called Ambrosius. Huh. Well, I, I don't know why I'm the one running this quiz. 
So uh, I think Bert would be equally annoyed by this quiz. Yeah. So I'm going Bert. You, I mean, if they had an Ernie, I would go for Ernie, and I'm pretty sure that would be both of us in a nutshell. I think we're done. That, we, we, spoilers. Like, <laughs> That's the end of the quiz, you, isn't it? <laughs> you have a bottle top collection, don't you? I'd put, you know what? I'm dangerously close to that being true. Yeah. <laughs> and whenever I come over and stay at your house, you and I actually stay in the same room in separate beds with little uh, yeah, nightcaps comedy on. Yeah, comedy single beds. Yeah, yep. yeah. Lucy has to come and tuck us in. <laughs> <laughs> it's just That's her lower half because she's pajamas. nanny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, who would I choose? Ooh, Jar- Jarleth. Jareth. Sorry. Okay, you going Bowie? Love it. Mm-hmm. All right, I wonder how much. I'm not looking ahead. Who knows how much more quiz there is. <laughs> 